This week on Political Capital, huge developments in Egypt. Hosni Mubarak steps down, the protesters win. We'll talk to our correspondent on the scene, Margaret Brennan. Also, Republicans and Democrats fire the first shots in the battle of the budget. We interview House Democratic Whip, Steny Hoyer. We begin the program with House Democratic Whip Steny Hoyer of Maryland. Thank you for being with us, Congressman. Always good to be with you. Republicans ran on slashing federal spending, and they're beginning to offer some details on scope and particulars. You don't like the spending cuts, or m many of them I know, but give us an idea of some specific cuts and the effects that you think they would have. Well, first of all, let me say that uh, we heard the message, uh, and we believe strongly we've got to get a handle on this deficit. It's unsustainable. We've got to cut spending. Uh, we frankly have to look at, across the board uh, at revenues, entitlements, defense, uh, discretionary spending. Uh, unfortunately, what the Republicans are doing is looking at only one segment of, of that. Which is discretionary. Uh, which is discretionary spending, which is about $450 billion of the $3.7 trillion. Any particular cuts that they are making that you think will? I think clearly they're looking at cuts in education, which are going to undermine what the president talks about investment. Every business leader I talk to says we've got to invest in education. China is, India is, Europe is, our, uh, our competitors are educating their young people so that they can be uh, competitors in the international global marketplace. Uh, they want to cut, as I understand it, uh, uh, funds from uh, programs which help us a safety net for some of our people, whether it's uh, nutritional programs, uh, they're gonna health cut, programs. Are they going to cut the NIH budget? I, I, I understand the basic biomedical research budget is, in fact, being cut. And what would now, be again, Al, I want to make it clear, as we talk, they have not put yet online uh, the cuts that they're proposing. And the reason they haven't done so is because they thought they had an agreement, uh, but that agreement fell apart. They had a very animated caucus um, this week. And as a result, uh, we don't yet have specific cuts. Obama said he is also going to offer painful cuts in his budget uh, It's going to come out on money. That's going to include reducing low-income energy assistance. It's going to include no longer a, a civilian pay parity with military. Is, are those going to be acceptable to you and your caucus? I think we're going to have to look at them. Again, his budget doesn't come out until uh, next week. Uh, so we're going to have to look at those. And uh, some of the information I hear is they're going to be painful cuts. Uh, women, infants, and children funding apparently is going to be cut. Uh, some of the cuts that you just mentioned, uh, low-income energy assistance cuts. Uh, that they're going to be troubling, particularly in a very cold winter with a lot of snow. People are going to so he have may needs. not get having, some of that. having said that, though, uh, I think it is a recognition by the administration, which we recognize as well, that there are going to have to be some very tough decisions uh, made. As you know, I've taken the position for the last uh, year that we're going to have to look across the board. Uh, and I applaud the two commissions that reported, uh, which reported across the board uh, focus and across the board fiscal discipline, financial cuts. Uh, I think that's going to be necessary. We need to get a handle on this deficit. The American people are correct. However, uh, the Republicans have deluded, I think, the American people and themselves in believing that the cuts that they want to get can be taken from about 13 or 14 percent of the budget uh, on which people rely. And you mentioned National Institutes of Health, which are looking at how to cure cancer, heart disease, uh, lung disease, diabetes, uh, chronic diseases that cost our nation very substantial amounts of money. And the investment in uh, either preventing them or treating them or curing them uh, are going to pay off in much bigger dollars. So. Uh, I think in some cases the Republicans are being penny wise and pound foolish. Uh, and Republicans say that, all right, if you want to have entitlements, the president has to lead on that. Should the president make some specific proposals on Social Security, say, and should that be tied to revenue increases also? Al, I've said and continue to believe that the president, uh, the Republicans in the House and Senate, and the Democrats in the House and Senate. Uh, need to sit down and come to grips with uh, how we deal with entitlements, defense spending, uh, and uh, and discretionary spending, because the deficit is in fact and not crisis. taxes uh, and taxes. Excuse me. I'm glad you mentioned that. Revenues have to be a part 
uh, of this package. But should the president tax take, reform needs to be a part of Should the of president this take the lead? In, in I think that? the president uh, took the lead when he appointed the commission uh, that has reported the Bull Simpson Commission. I think the recommendations they made are very useful recommendations. That doesn't mean I agree with every one of them, but. We've got to for, uh, follow a formula similar to the recommendations, not only of that commission, uh, but of the D D Domenici Ribbon. Do you think anything will happen, seriously? I hope so. I, I know you I, hope I, so, but I, do you think anything I, will I happen? Think, I think it can. I think that when I talk to David Camp, when I talk to Paul Ryan, when I talk to other Republicans, uh, they believe uh, action needs to be taken. And they will not just say, we're not going to talk about taxes. They're, they're uh, gonna... At this point in time, they will say, we ought not to be talking about revenues. They won't talk about revenues. But I th they know in the back of their heads, uh, even if they don't articulate it, that revenues, uh, as, as each one of the commissions, headed up by Republicans, right. as, as, as uh, the members, two of the three members, Republicans from the Senate, signed on to the commission report, which said that revenues have to be so, a part of this. So I think the answer to that question is that I think all sides understand that if you don't consider all of the options, including revenues, including defense, including entitlements, uh, just focusing on discretionary spending, which is a, a relatively small part of the pie, but is a very visible part of the pie and lends itself to demagoguery, uh, you will not solve this problem. The business community says it wants corporate tax reform that reduces overall corporate taxes. Is that doable? I think that uh, the president said in his State of the Union now that uh, we need to be competitive with the world. Uh, we have an agenda that's called the Make It in America agenda. I'm pushing it very, very hard. Make It in America, of course, means two things. A, we're going to succeed in America. We're going to have a brighter future. We're going to grow our economy and compete with the rest of the world. And it also means we're going to make it. We're going to manufacture it or grow it in America and sell it here and abroad. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to look at tax policy and regulatory policy and to make sure that we have an environment, we've created an environment, in which people can profitably make it in America. So when you do corporate America, tax reform. So the answer to your question is, we've got to have a corporate tax structure uh, that is, in fact, competitive with the rest of the world. One of the things we have to do, in my opinion, is look at all the extraordinary complexity of our tax code, the loopholes that have been uh, put into it. Uh, I think we ought to reduce uh, preference items very substantially and bring rates down. So therefore, it would be revenue neutral. You would not have a corporate tax cut. I talked to a corporate leader the other day. I said, look, you, you, let me mention corporate new, uh, uh, revenue uh, neutral. I said, look, on the one hand, you have said our deficit is a real problem. Right. On the other hand, you say you want to reform the tax code with, and have revenue neutrality. The two are uh, not compatible. Uh, in order for us to bring down the deficit, we've got to cut spending, but we've also got to increase revenue. We've got to increase revenue because right now we're at the lowest level of tax collections of revenues we've been Let in over half a century. Let me just make sure I have this right then. Corporate tax reform that doesn't lose revenue. Is that, is that your position? Uh, I would be for tax, yes. Uh, I think uh, neutrality in that sense. Congressman Hoyer, thank you so much for being with us. And when we come back, we'll talk to Bloomberg reporters about the battle of the budget and about the crisis in Cairo. Welcome back. Budget 2012 will be released Monday. That's Valentine's Day. The timing, though, may not help generate a lot of love. Bloomberg's White House reporter Hans Nichols and congressional correspondent Julie Davis join us now to explain why. Hans, the Obama budget cuts they advertise are going to be painful, but isn't really going to be more symbolic, especially compared to what Republicans are talking about up there? Well, what White House officials will tell you is that there isn't the political seriousness to deal with anything beyond the symbolism. So their first move is to go ahead and attack programs proposed cuts on things that they actually have championed in the past, home heating oil for the poor, uh, some, of, uh, some of the community block development grants. But they could end up getting, and they're certainly aware of this, the worst of worst of, of both worlds. They could have Democrats on their left attack them, and they could have Republicans scoff and say this isn't serious. There isn't a single se senior administration official that I've spoken to this week that thinks he'll be more popular after the budget lands than before. Well, in order to stem that erosion, perhaps, next week they're going on the road and the president <laughs> is going to talk about green jobs, infrastructure. He will call that investment. Republicans say that's just spending but another name. 
That's fine. And that's certainly the White House would ex almost accept that criticism. So look, we all talk about budgets and them being a big deal. They're essentially enunciations of the president's priorities. And he's very committed to clean, uh, clean technology, green jobs. The stimulus package itself had some $90 billion in there. He might have another $8 billion in this, uh, in this new budget. They'll talk about their priorities. Republicans will talk about theirs. This is actually an argument the White House wants to have moving forward. What's going to create jobs? The White House thinks they have some sort of plan in terms of green technology. And Julie, from the other side of Pennsylvania Avenue, how does the battle of the budget look to Republicans now? Well, to start off, you have to you have to say that it's it's taking place on their terms. So they're pretty happy with the the broad brush themes of the of the debate, which right now is not should we cut spending, but how much should we cut right. spending? But when you get down to specifics, they are having a hard time. It's it's a painful process because it's exposed some rifts within Republican ranks. You have the leadership wanting to come out with a proposal that sounds responsible and that at the same time meets what they said was their pledge to America when they ran for Congress and they energized the Tea Party supporters, um, that they were going to cut $100 billion. Well, that's hard to do, and they've found that uh, they have some conservatives on their flank and their rank and file. Riffs is a nice way to put it. This looked like the House. I know you covered the Senate mainly, but the House uh, GOP leadership looked like the, the uh, it couldn't do a one-car funeral. It was so goofed up this week. Well, the budget was just one one example of that, and they right. had a, a real conservative result, revolta over that. But they also had some, uh, you might say, beginner's mistakes. They had to pull a trade bill yeah. because they found it didn't have enough support from Republicans. They had two uh, bills that they tried to pass under um, suspension of the rules, a non-controversial process where you need two-thirds that failed simply because they didn't have a, an overwhelming majority to pass them. I mean, I think what this really shows is two things. First of all, they've not been in the majority for four years. They're a little out of practice. Right. Uh, they, they didn't do their homework in terms of did they have the votes and educate their members, which is the key thing to, to sort of tip people off to what's coming up and make sure that there aren't uh, concerns in their own ranks about them. But second of all, it really shows that, you know, when they have... Uh, 63 new mem 63 uh, new freshmen and all these uh, Tea Party supported people who have not just conservative but really libertarians in their right. district who who want to keep government out of a lot of a lot of things. Trade is one of them, and this other bill that failed was was uh, about the United Nations. Um, I think you really have to 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 the calculus is, is more difficult, and they're are, finding that. Are now. we going to see specifics anytime soon? They, on, the, they, on, on the budget? On, on, on the GOP side. They really have avoided specifics. They've talked in numbers, but we don't know exactly how much it is. You are going to see specifics. And you've, you saw some specifics this week when House Republicans put out a, a partial list of what their cuts are going to be. Um, but you're going to see more specifics. And the more specifics that they offer, I think the more difficulty they're going to have um, with their own members and also selling it as a responsible plan that won't hinder uh, job right. creation and, and economic re recovery. Julie, Chris, we hardly knew you. Chris Lee, the married Republican congressman from New York, emails out a picture of himself shirtless while soliciting romance. And he uses his own name. Now, I, this guy must have an IQ of less than room temperature. Uh, seriously, Julie, he was gone in four hours. Did the House Republican leadership push him out? They say that they didn't. Um, you know, it's been reported in the past that House Speaker John Boehner had talked to some, some members of, of his party saying, you know, the partying with the female lobbyists, it has to stop, you have to behave better. Um, but, but they're saying publicly, and, and Speaker Boehner said it again this week, that, you know, he made his own decision and he did what he had to do. The reality is this broke at 2.30 in the afternoon, and because of the, p the pace of the Internet and blogs and emails, um, it, it was all over in, in less than three hours. Boy, Chris Lee is all over. <laughs> Okay, Hans, let's go to the big story. There must have been a sigh of relief at the White House that could have been heard all the way in the Middle East when Mubarak resigns. And one of the reasons it could be heard is because the president's going to be on the phone with a lot of world leaders, particularly in the next few weeks in the Middle East, as he tries to reassure them where his administration is. One of the balancing acts that the White House had to really navigate here was between interests and ideals. They never wanted to get too far out in front of the story, too far out in front of this wave. Sometimes there was the appearance in these 19 days of this crisis that they were behind it. White House probably finally thinks that they got on the right side of history, but the fulcrum was Cairo. No telling where this lever of history, where the scales tip from here. Well, that's true. Does the White House have any sense? Let's just take Egypt. What's going to happen in Egypt? in the ensuing couple weeks. They have a sense of how they want it to unfold. One of the things in a president's address was a clear memo to the military in Egypt laying out four things that they need to do, protect the rights of the people, free and fair elections, repeal emergency law, and
and constitutional reform, it's clear that the White House is going to be leaning on the military to be the transitioners and the guarantors of democracy moving forward. That means respect for minority rights as well. Certainly in a political sense, Obama survived his first crisis really with something close to flying colors. Uh, Whatever the uh, the merits there, there's very little political criticism. Uh, what the White House will try to say is that there's a clear rhetorical line between Cairo, this, the, the 18, 19 days of this crisis, and the president's final comments on this. Whatever ambient noise there is, they can always look back to the president's words and say they were consistent and they yielded results. Well, yeah, and it was a it was an extraordinary event. They were behind the curve sometimes, but everybody was behind the curve because we weren't sure where the curve was. The nature was of the White House, the nature of any presidency, very difficult to say then. Uh, that are moving this fast, especially in a blinding age. All right, thank you, Hans Nichols, and thank you, Julie Davis. And we'll stay on the Mubarak story when we come back. We'll talk to Bloomberg's Margaret Brennan. We'll go to Margaret Carlson and Cato O'Byrne in just a moment. But first, Cairo is celebrating the departure of Hosni Mubarak. Bloomberg's Margaret Brennan is on the ground in Egypt witnessing a new dawn in that country. Margaret, let me start off. Just describe the mood, mood as you overlook that square on this extraordinary day when they heard that Hosni Mubarak was leaving. Al, a roar, an absolute cacophony of voices just erupted from Tahrir Square right below me. You can still hear some of it now, but this is just a din of, of what happened uh, when it finally was announced by Vice President Omar Suleiman that, in fact, President Hosni Mubarak would be leaving. Remember, it took three speeches. It took a lot of political gestures up to this point uh, before Hosni Mubarak uh, came to the realization or was pushed to it that he did, in fact, need to leave office. So there had been a lot of highs and lows among this crowd, and tonight it's really, it belongs to them. It's just a, it's a, it's a celebration behind me. Margaret, did the protesters, I guess, they got what they wanted. Does that mean the end of social unrest for now? The protesters got what they wanted for now, but will they get the Egypt that they're asking for tomorrow? That's going to be the story that we're going to have to continue to watch. A big part of that is, you know, what does the change at the top mean? What does the military in charge mean in terms of delivering on those promises uh, to make a better life for these people? 35% of this population is under the age of 30. They need jobs. They need food that's affordable. They need this economy to get back to functioning well, and it's come to a standstill in the past two weeks. So those are the big questions in terms of ultimately resolving the social unrest here. Can the political elite, can the business elite come together in the new Egypt to create those 600,000 jobs a year that need to be created just to keep the current employment levels? The power has been turned over to the army on a transitional basis at least. Uh, President Obama just called for the army to restore some of the freedoms that have been denied for so many years over there. Do you have any sense of, of, of exactly what role the army is going to play in the weeks and months ahead? Al, it's so unclear. The comparison that people keep making, and I don't think it's a, a clear one, is what happens in Turkey. In Turkey, here's what's different. There is a constitution that is set, that is considered almost sacred in Turkey, that the military steps in to protect. Here in Egypt, right now, we are watching a new government try to create a new constitution. So in many ways, it's it's uncertain as to the guidance, the, the laws that are going to be outlining what this new regime will look like with the military in charge. What we do know, as well as you well know, is the ties that the U.S. military has to the Egyptian military, the $1.3 billion in aid, the tremendous amount of arms that are given to them and training. So uh, you've got to believe that there are plenty of communications between Cairo and Washington uh, when it comes to those generals and those tanks that we see. Uh, there's a tank just right below me here in the street that you're seeing protesters take pictures on, uh, you know, with kids holding up flags. So for the moment, they're celebrating the military, but this is going to be a story we're going to have to continue to track. Do you think there will actually be elections in September? If there aren't, well, that's the danger. You see heightened expectations out here. That That's the danger of empowering people. And it, these people do feel empowered right now because nominally they got what they wanted. President Mubarak steps down. If they don't get elections that appear to be fair or do tremendously change uh, what happens in day-to-day -day life here, then the story, this unrest isn't done. Margaret, it's an exciting day and it's exciting to see you there. Thank you very, very much. Let's go now to Margaret and Kate <laughs> on the Reagan legacy.
I'm going to guess on this week where Ronald Reagan would have turned 100 uh, that you think liberals are trying to hijack oh, the Ronald Reagan legacy. Uh, Did I guess right? Liberals belatedly find so much to admire about dead conservatives. When they're alive, not so much. Now, Reagan-esque is a huge compliment. It's even applied to Barack Obama. And uh, having been a Reagan appointee and knowing that we were treated as mean-spirited ideologues, and proudly so, <laughs> um, <laughs> I never it's so completely you ridiculous, Al. And it's done in order to discredit today's conservative politicians and today's conservative activists. We're told Ronald Reagan presided over this great bipartisan friendships on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill. Let's remember, Tip O'Neill talked about the evil man in the White House. He called Ronald Reagan cold and mean with ice water in his blood. That's what Ronald Reagan really faced. But Ronald Reagan used to mm -hmm. talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt right. in glowing terms. And by the way, or, this is what Ron Reagan, his son, recently called him in his book. Listen, the Republicans have been so successful at mythologizing Ronald Reagan that he's all things to all people. In fact, the mythology makes Camelot look like, you know, a, a walk in the park. Um, today's conservatives aren't like Ronald Reagan. If you look at Ronald, what Ronald Reagan did, he yes, he lowered taxes once, he raised taxes a couple of times. He increased spending. The, these conservatives, uh, everyone can look to, to a gauzy Hollywood image of a morning in America kind well, of guy. I'm not going to settle this debate, but I'll yes. tell you, I disagree with a lot of his policies, but one thing he did do, he proved the government could work, and I think that's undeniable no matter which side of the uh, aisle but you want. But it was on. too darn big. But, uh, yeah, but it didn't change. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank both of you very much, and thank all of you for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Political Capital is a production of Bloomberg Television.